For the fifth Sunday after Easter, we read from the epistle of the Apostle St. James. Beloved, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and presently he forgets what kind of man he is. But he who has looked carefully into the perfect law of liberty and has remained in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, he shall be blessed in his deed. And if anyone thinks himself to be religious, not restraining his tongue, but receiving his, deceiving excuse me, his own heart, that man's religion is vain. Religion pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their tribulation and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in parables. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in parables, but will speak to you plainly of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly and utterest no parable. Now we know that thou knowest all things and dost not need that anyone should question thee. For this reason we believe that thou camest forth from God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, seat of wisdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> My dear friends, today I would like to speak to you of the saint that we would celebrate today being May the 5th. It's actually the feast day of St. Pius V. And this is a very important pope, a very important saint for our, our position. And well, for all Catholics, not only for all Catholics, I'll say for all of the Western world. It's a very significant time in history, and I will try to, to mention those things. Because it was at the same time that Luther was starting his revolt in Germany. And also at the same time that the Muslim empire was very close, actually quite close, to conquer all of Europe. And with that also, eventually would have been America. So this was the Pope that had to deal with all these things. On a certain occasion, there was a, a priest that confided in me and he, he was just celebrating his 25th anniversary. And this priest had gone through all kinds of troubles. And he said to me, he said, if someone had shown me before becoming a priest all the difficulties, all the problems that I would have to go through, I would have said no. I would have chickened out. It's still worth it, he said, but probably if someone had shown me at that moment everything, I would have not done it. But now, you know, our Lord led me little by little. And well, one thinks of this poor Pope, who at his time, I mean, his, his, what he had to go through, because he faced really the worst possible situation you could see in history. And we'll see through that. Pius V was born poor. He was born in Lombardy, in Bosco, in 1504. Around the same time, there was a man called Martin Luther, who was entering, a, entering an Augustinian monastery in Germany. And one year before his birth of Pius V, the Ottoman Turks had defeated Venice. In, in a war that they had with them, and they had obtained in that way supremacy over all of the Mediterranean Sea. The name of his birth was Antonio Gislieri, but he took the name Michael when he became a religious in the Dominican order at the early age of 14 years old. As soon as he became a religious, he became known among his peers 
for the time of prayer that he would have, the long prayers, the long penances that he would do, his strong discipline in religious life. And so much so that he was made soon enough a master of novices. That means that he was in charge of educating the new religious. He was made the superior even of some of the convents. Now, while Ghislieri, Michael Ghislieri, is pursuing his religious studies in the monastery, he's becoming a saint, he is growing in virtue during these years. Martin Luther in Germany was challenging the church. By then, he had abandoned his monastery. He had posted the 95 theses that made them famous, sadly famous. And these theses included the theses 6 and 38, where he denied the power of the church to forgive sins. The Theses 13, where he denied purgatory. His revolt, his teachings, his attitude caused great trouble, great difficulties in Germany. And in 1521, an attempt was made to try to make him retract his doctrines, come back to the church. This was done at the Diet of Worms. That was like a meeting that they had where there were noblemen, there was Luther, there was a legate, for, a legate from the Pope. And there Luther's response to their efforts was to say, I will not retract my book unless you show me where, it's, where in it there is a contradiction to the Bible. The, that would be the motto for all Protestants in the future years. But let's see the results that came from Luther's teachings. The peasants started reading his books, and soon enough, you had a revolt. All of the center and the south of Germany, peasants started revolting against the noblemen. Now, the merits of their reasons, you might, be, you might question. But Luther at first sided with the peasants. And he wrote to them and he said to them, the sword of the vengeance of God lays upon the princes that you're fighting. In other words, go ahead, do your struggle, do your fight. Do your revolution. Well, you can imagine how this ended. The noblemen crushed the peasants, killed thousands of them. Then what does Luther do? He goes now to the other side. He is now taking shelter with one of the princes. And now he writes a book that is called Against the Murderer Gangs of Peasants. And in this book, he, he summons the princess. And I quote, to tear the peasants apart, strangle them, cut through them secretly or publicly, wherever and however, as you put down one with the rabies. That was the character of this man that called himself the reformer of the church, Luther. By 1525, he had taken a nun out of the convent and married her. Through his doctrines, he made her apostatize. Her name was. Catherine of Bora. Three years after this horrible uh, happening of Luther committing this act of apostasy and unchastity, Michael Ghislieri, our good priest that we had left in Italy, or rather our good monk, was being ordained a priest. That would happen in, in Genoa. By the time he became a priest, all this horrible news of the things that were happening with Lutheranism were reaching uh, Italy. And so he spent the first 16 years of his priesthood fighting against this error. He would do lectures, he would, uh, he would write, and he actually proposed 30 theses himself in support of the papacy and in support of the Catholic Church. Now, Michael Ghislieri also knew that the church needed reform. He knew that the church was in a bad, in a bad state. And this is a topic for another sermon, perhaps. I'm I'll, you'll excuse me for this little class of history. But the reason why the church was doing so badly spiritually at that time, there were many reasons, but among those you can name two. The first one I would name is the Black Plague. The Black Plague had happened about a century before. And consider this was a real pandemic where 50% of the world died. Now that is a catastrophe. And that caused all the disciplines in monasteries, in dioceses, everywhere to relax in order to help the people that were dying. The other cause that, that, the other thing that caused a loss of morality in Europe was the fall of Constantinople. 
Constantinople was the last place, the last uh, fortress, you could say, where the Greek culture resided. The Greek culture had still remains of paganism, hedonism, just very many things that were not very moral. And when Constantinople falls, all of those people who were Christians flee to Italy. And that's where you have the Renaissance, the rebirth of paganism from all the materials, all the ideas that they bring. That's what had caused the church to be in such a bad state. Michael Ghislieri, our priest that we left, he knew all these things and he also wanted to reform the church, but he started reforming from within. He became known because he was poor. He would walk uh, barefoot to his missions. He would have no garments to, to shelter himself. He was a long prayer. He would correct priests and clergy when he saw them do bad things. This caused Rome to notice him. And so he was summoned to a very important mission, the mission of the Inquisition. If this sermon had chapters, this is chapter two. Let's talk about the Inquisition a little bit, because that's one thing that most Catholics also misinterpret or don't know about. Most of us think that the Inquisition was an institution that was made to judge heretics and Jews and Muslims, and it burned a bunch of people all the time. That's not true. The Inquisition was made to judge bishops and priests first, and then the other stuff. And it didn't kill that many people. And actually, most of the times it didn't kill anybody. It would deliver people to the government, and then the government would apply the death penalty. Why was this done? Let me give you, go back a little bit to the background. So Luther's revolt is happening in Germany. France is also starting to have wars. England is starting to have wars because of the Protestant ideas. Catholic rulers, the first thing that they think is this, we have to stop this poisonous ideology to enter into our country. We'll ban the books, we'll ban the people that are trying to bring it in. Because of this, the Protestants created, had a new device where they wanted to infiltrate the church unnoticed. This is not me saying it. There is historical facts that prove it. There was at that moment a movement called of the Nicodemus, Nicodemus that attempted to bring priests and bishops into the church with Protestant ideas in secret and they would only reveal themselves once they had the power. That's why they were called the Nicodemus after that disciple of our Lord that was in hiding. It was to fight these attempts of infiltration that the Inquisition was made. And there it was that Michael Ghislieri, the future Pope Pius V, was made an actual inquisitor. He was made one of those who would judge of those things. Now, oftentimes, as I said, the Inquisition is attacked and they, they say that they just wanted to kill everyone. And here you see the truth of it. Michael Ghislieri actually became uh, renowned because of his moderation. At one point, there were, there were serious accusations against the Archbishop of uh, Toledo, Bartolomé Carranza. This poor man spent a lot, of, a lot of time in prison because of all the accusations against him. Many people, politicians, wanted him dead. Michael Ghislieri, this priest that we're talking about, our saint, he opposed these politicians. And even he opposed the Pope when he was mistaken about this. And he saved uh, or at least he opposed the death of Mar Bartolome Carranza. About the year 1556, through his merits, he was made the Bishop of Sutri. Only 10 years after Luther had died, exclaiming in his last illness, Luther, Pope, living I was your plague, dying I shall be your death. Those were the beautiful, beautiful, sarcastically I say it, feelings that Luther had in his deathbed. Now, 10 years after he was made a bishop, Pope Pius IV died, and now comes the election of a new pope. Here is a very beautiful detail of his life. He didn't want to be a pope, as most popes did not want to, but he was another saint that pushed for it. The Cardinal Charles Borromeo, whom we know now as Saint Charles Borromeo, he was the one that started moving and, and trying to get all the cardinals to vote for Father Michael Ghislieri. 
and he was elected a pope and crowned on January 18th, 1566, just two years after the Council of Trent had ended. The council that you could say was perhaps the most important in the church. Now, my dear friends, this is where you get really the idea of this, of the value of this saint. See, let's try to see the picture of the world that he had when he became a pope. He had three great threats. One was the Muslims. As I mentioned, the Muslim rule was spreading by then all throughout Africa, throughout the Mediterranean Sea, throughout the East. You could say, without exaggeration, I think, that Constantinople, the Muslims, were the greatest power in the world at that time, militarily and economically. Just one year before he, made, he was made a pope, that same empire had tried to, to conquer, to take the island of Malta, which was the gateway of Italy. If you take Malta, you, you conquer Europe, basically. This is another story in itself, but 40,000 Turks went against this one island, which was defended by only 500 Catholic knights. The last knights of history, the Hospitaliter Knights, defended this island heroically. And they didn't take it. The Muslims could not take it. Still, they were a power. They were great economically, and they had assembled by then a great fleet that uh, summoned around 222 galleys. That was the first enemy. The second threat that he faced was the Protestant Revolution. By then, Protestantism had taken England, it had taken uh, Scotland, it had taken half of Germany, it had taken the Netherlands, parts of France. The only kingdoms that remained Catholic were Spain, Ireland, Portugal, and Italy. And you have already heard what kind of havoc it was causing. The third enemy, and the worst, was within the church. The attempts of infiltration in the church, the corruption of bishops, of priests. At that time, it was not mandatory to go to the seminary. If you wanted to become a priest, all you had to do was go to your bishop, take a little test, he would be examining you, and just like confirmation, you would be ordered a priest right there and then. Where are you going to go? You couldn't, they didn't need to know. Did you have a mission? They did not need to know. You could just be at your home, but that you could become a priest like that. That was the discipline of the church at that time. So that was the third enemy that the Pope had, the, the abuses from within. Now, my friends, think of this. This is where the lives of the saints become very interesting for us. If you ever look at your life and you say to yourself, how difficult my life is and how many things I have to deal with and... Why does God put so many things in my plate? Think of this one man, a man like you, who got tired, who got stressed, who was afraid, who didn't know everything. And God put him in this position where he is the head of the whole Western world and the person in charge of dealing with all these great three threats. Because no one else will. It's his mission. Let's talk to end with the sermon. Let's talk to of those three things that he managed to, to do. Against the enemy within, the enemy in the church, what he did is he enacted all the disciplines and commands of the Council of Trent. Pope Pius V is the one that established this missile that I use for the Mass in perpetuity for it to be used for all ages. He is the one that established the ritual that I used to give you the sacraments, baptism and confirmation. He established also the Roman breviary. He made it a law that from now on, all priests would have to go to what we call now a seminary, a diocesan school, where the bishop would have to see that he had virtue. He would have to put him to the test. He would have him there for years, training him in theology, training him in philosophy, training him in history also and sciences. That was from now on the law of the church. You could not get ordained unless you went to one of those. Not only that, now you cannot be a vagrant priest. You can only be ordained if there is a place for you to go. You can only be ordained if someone's going to support you. Otherwise, you cannot be ordained. Even to this day, when the bishop ordains us, 
he has to say he's ordained under this title, meaning under this support. Among these, many other reforms that this Holy Pope established. And that was the best way to overcome also the second threat, Protestantism. Because what he was doing was a real reform of the church. Often we call what the Protestants do, did, a reform. It wasn't a reform, it was a revolution. The word reform means to reinstate, to bring back something to its original form, to what it was. And so what Luther did was a deformation. He took what the church was, and he destroyed that, and he created a new thing. What Pius V did was a true reform. He took the church, and he brought it back to what it was before the bubonic plague, before these abuses had crept in. But he also addressed the problem of Protestantism by a direct confrontation with the powers that be. Always remember this when you talk to your Protestant friends. Protestantism was a political movement more than a religious one. It would have never amounted to anything had it not been because they were noblemen, kings and queens who wanted to support it to gain power, just like Islam. And so the Pope confronted these kings. He confronted the king of France when he enacted a, a, a law that allowed the Protestants to have their services. He deposed a cardinal and seven bishops in France who had supported this movement. He, as you know, excommunicated Queen Isabel I in England. This evil woman had ascended to the throne of England, claimed for herself the title of governor of the Church of England, and had put the Queen Mary, Queen Mary in, in jail. And the Pope violently, across the canal, raised his voice and he said, you're excommunicated. And not only that, none of your subjects owe allegiance to you from now on. They're all released of their allegiance. And lastly, the one most exciting for men, I think, because it's the, the one that, is, um, that has more action in it, is what he did against Islam. Always remember this too. A lot of people throw into the Catholic Church's face that we went and fought against the Muslims. No. We defended ourselves. Islam was by then advancing through the Mediterranean Sea with almost 300 galleys ready to invade Italy. And that was their plan. They made it known. Their idea was to invade Italy, Rome, and from there spread throughout Europe. My dear friends, I want you to understand the significance of this moment. If this one man, Pius V, had not opposed one man, if he had not opposed this movement, Spain would have been Muslim, France would have been Muslim, England would have been Muslim. You would not be speaking English here. Because Mexico and Latin America would have been conquered not by Spaniards, but by Muslims. And the colonies here in America would not have been a colony of Protestants, it would have been a colony of Muslims too. And we would all be under this tyranny that we see now in the Middle East. What stopped that from happening? This one man. He summoned all the kingdoms. Many, very few uh, came forth, only Spain and Venice. And they summoned then 65,000 Catholics against 75,000 Muslims with their slaves. 206 galleys against 222. And they went and met them at what we call now the Battle of Lepanto, the greatest naval, ba naval battle in history. And they conquered the Muslims, and that changed not only the story of the Catholic Church, the story of the whole Western world, of the, all of our civilization. This great Pope was the one that did that. But, I'm almost done with this, but this is the important part to remember, it wasn't the armies of galleys and soldiers. More than that, he summoned a bigger army in Europe, the army of the Catholic faithful to pray the rosary. And he enacted and he said, I want everyone to be praying the rosary for this battle. 
They say nobody knew when the battle was happening. Obviously, this is not the age of information. Nobody knew what was happening. They just saw the fleet leave. But one day, October the 7th, Pope Pius V is watching in his window, and he stood silent and he looked towards the east for several hours. Nobody could distract him. They couldn't move him out of there. Then at one point, he exclaimed, victory, we won. Nobody knew what had happened, but later on, they found out at that moment, John of Austria leading that great uh, army, that great uh, fleet, with the banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe, had won the battle. My dear friends, to end the sermon today, we also face three enemies. We face the same enemy of Protestantism, which can also be alluring, especially to our youth. We face also the enemy within of Vatican II, the infiltration in the church. And we face also the enemy of the flesh, of paganism, the, so the pagan society that we live in today. To fight these enemies, we also have power. We have the power that our Lord gives us. We can follow the example of this courageous Pope. We see the beautiful and glorious examples that the church has given us. Today, as we continue with Mass, let us pray to Pope Pius V that we may all remain faithful to our Catholic faith, and most importantly, that we have access to that, the greatest of weapons that he did, the Most Holy Rosary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.